By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we bring you live magic. Well, actually it's not live, it's been played already. That, sorry, that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, we bring you magic from the Dusseldorf Urborg Forest Frenzy. And I'm really excited to show you some of the matches that were played there because it was my first foreign uh, old school magic tournament in a while. So it was held in Germany. I live in Amsterdam, so I did a little road trip to get there uh, with my buddy Hank. Shout out to you, man. Thanks for driving. And um, yeah, it was really, really cool. Um, it's just good that we're able to do these things again. And I'm just really happy to show you some of the matches. Uh, this is promising to be a really cool one, by the way. This is... Uh, a game played in the Swiss round. We're going to see um, Edo taking on Erwin. And Edo, he's playing this absolutely beautiful, beautiful deck. It's a reanimator deck. Oh, man. I just I can't wait to do the deck deck. I'll like, show you this deck picture. It's absolutely sick. And he's playing against Erwin. And he's also playing a pretty, pretty cool deck. And it's uh, it's Urnum on Ice. But he's he's tweaked it. It's interesting. I like it. So uh, and, and I really like the deck photo, Erwin, by the way. It's beautiful. Now, before I jump in to the deck decks, I would just like to point out that, as always, you can skip that. You can go straight to the games by checking the timestamps that you can find in the description below. So there you will find several timestamps. One of them reads MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the MTG game action. So if you want to skip the deck text, that's probably the best way to do it. Um, also, if you'd like to know the specific rules of this tournament, what old school rules there were uh, followed here, check the description below because there you can find all the information on that. Um, so, okay, that's kind of what I wanted to say in this intro. So now I guess we're ready for the deck text. I'm going to start with the deck of Edo. Let's take a look at his, at his reanimator brew. And here we see the deck of Edo. And man, this is a beauty. Now, there's something happening with this deck because th there are actually two decks that we're going to look at in this deck deck. So you've got the main deck plan, which is reanimator, right? And then you've got the sideboard plan, which is stasis time vault so it's a completely different deck it's really stasis control um and we call that in magic a transformational sideboard so when you have a sideboard that has such a big impact on your strategy that you're basically playing two decks in one deck so that's definitely a trick that Edo is is probably going to use in his matchup here against Erwin. Now let's first look at his main deck plan, right? So this is Reanimator. He's playing with three All Hallows Eves. He's playing with three Animate Deaths. And when you play with those cards, what you basically want to do is get as many fatties as possible into your graveyard as fast as possible. And then you want to cast an Animate Dead or even better, an All Hallows Eve. Get all your fatties back on the board and basically win the game, right? Overwhelm your opponent with threats. So maybe it's good to first kind of start with the core of an old school reanimator deck. And that is really the Bazaar of Baghdad. So Bazaar of Baghdad, a card from uh, Arabian Nights. It's a land and it you can tap it and it simply says draw two cards and then you have to discard three cards. Now, you know, at the time... Um, not a lot of people played with Bazaar of Baghdad because they felt like, okay, I, I draw two cards, but I've got to discard three. That's not a good deal. I'm basically throwing away a card from my hand and two, two cards I just drew from my deck. Like this whole idea of Reanimator, it, it existed, but it wasn't something that was super popular. And now with the modern old school era, you see more people kind of wanting to play this these type of decks. Why? Because it allows you, I mean, if we look at the list of Edo, it allows you to play with just some of the coolest creatures in the game. And, you know, and you can get them all on the board at once. I mean, that's one of the coolest things that you can do in old school magic, right? You just get a lot of big, fat creatures on the board and kill your opponent with it. Uh, and Reanimator allows you to do that. Now, there's one big problem. You have to be fortunate enough to actually own four Bazaar of Baghdads because they are ridiculously expensive. Now, as you can see, Edo here, he owns four. So I'm really jealous of your collection, Edo. And talking about his collection, look at some of the beautiful signed cards here in his deck. We've got Nico Bolas. We've got Johan. Uh, we've got a beautiful signed Mana Drain there. We've got uh, a nice Christopher Rush. Some signings from him in this deck as well. So it's just, uh, it's a beautiful deck picture to look at, a beautiful deck to look at. So he wants to use his Bazaar of Baghdads, right, to get his creatures in the bin. Now, what he wants to do next is he wants to use All Hallows Eve, right, to get those creatures back. Now, in case you're not familiar with the card, All Hallows Eve is a card from Legends, 
And I'm just going to read the current uh, Oracle text, you know, just, just so that we all know what this card does in today's standards. Okay, so All Hallows Eve, two black and two to cast for a sorcery. And um, exile All Hallows Eve with two scream counters on it. That's kind of how it starts. At the beginning of your upkeep, if All Hallows Eve is exiled with a scream counter on it, remove a scream counter from it. If there are no more scream counters on it, put it in your graveyard and each player returns all creature cards from their graveyard to the battlefield. So it's really weird. You cast this card and the first thing that happens is it gets two scream counters and it's exiled. So the ability actually doesn't resolve yet. First, the two scream counters have to be removed from All Hallows Eve and then you get this ability and the ability is um, that when there are no more scream counters on it, um, put it into your graveyard and each player returns all creature cards from the graveyard to the battlefield, right? So this goes for each player. Now, obviously, this will be really good for Edo, right? As the reanimator player, because what he'll do, he'll, he'll just make sure that, you know, his whole graveyard is filled with big fatties. So he doesn't really mind. Maybe his opponent is lucky and has, you know, one big creature in the bin, like, I don't know, in this case, an Urnum Jinn or something. But that's fine. He's going to have Sol Canard the Swamp King. He's going to have, you know, um, if he's lucky, Nicol Bolas. He's going to have Sarah Angels in there. I mean, he's going to be absolutely fine. He's not worried about that. So um, that is his strategy. And on top of that, he also plays with three anime deaths to get the fatties back as well. And as you can see, he's also playing with a Mind Twist so, and, and, and a Wheel of Fortune and a Time Twister. So one of like the nastier things he can do is actually force his opponent to discard some of his fat creatures and then he can animate dead those creatures as well. And he can then maybe play in All Hallows Eve and also get his creatures back. So make it like in a super one-sided game where he will have all the big fatties and swing in with that. That's actually something I'm looking forward to. I'm just really hoping that he's going to be able to cast one of those beautiful legendary creatures that we see uh, in the middle of this deck. Now, um, at the start of this deck deck, I talked about the transformational sideboard. So let's just kind of focus on that a little bit as well. So as you can see, he's playing with a Swords to Plows here. It's a Disenchant, four Vices, three Time Volts, and he's playing with two Kismats. So Kismats, kind of a nice uh, classical combination with Stasis. It's an uh, enchantment from Legends, one white and three, and it says, all the lands, artifacts, and creatures of the opponent come into play tap because he's also playing under the... Uh, under this card, under the Kismet, we see four Stasis, right? So Stasis says nothing untaps. So you can already see this combo, right? It's one of the oldest uh, synergies and combos that people played uh, in control. That was this Stasis or Prison Control, I should say. It was this Stasis Kismet situation. So it's really old school. And he's also playing with a Time Vault. And a Time Vault and Stasis is quite nice, especially when you have a Vice on there as well. Because with Time Vault, it comes into play tapped. If you want to untap it, you have to give your opponent an extra turn, which may sound really bad, but if your opponent is locked, everything that he has is stepped down with your stasis, you actually want to give him an extra turn. So you want to untap your time vault, give your opponent an extra turn, that means he takes more damage from the vice if you have a vice on board, you know, so it doesn't matter. And then when it's your turn, you can actually, uh, whenever you want, tap the time vault again and get that turn back, right? So you can, you can then take an extra turn, which is exceptionally good when you're playing it with stasis because what can happen in stasis sometimes is you can run out of islets right because every upkeep you got to tap an island but your islands don't untap because of stasis so you've got to have an island extra island every turn to kind of keep the stasis around now if you cannot pay for the upkeep cost anymore you'll have this situation where you are everything you own is basically tapped you lose the stasis and you've got to pass turn to your opponent and your opponent gets to untap everything, probably has a full hand and he's probably just going to kill you, right? So it's great when you've got the time vault because with the time vault, you've probably untapped it somewhere in the process. So then you can tap your time vault again. You can take an extra turn and that means that you'll actually be the first one who gets to untap and gets to play his spells and maybe play a second stasis that's in your hand. So time vault is exceptionally good with stasis and um you know it's just really crazy to see this as a sideboard plan it's actually kind of mean of you Edo man i feel sorry already for ervin i mean wow because what's probably going to happen right if i would play against Edo's deck i would see like this whole reanimator strategy right so he's going to have really big fat creatures so what i want to do is i want to make sure i've got like enough creature removal 
maybe I've got like mazes, sorts to plow series is great because a creature is exiled. You know, I want to get some land destruction for maybe those those bazaars of Baghdad. So I'm going to kind of board focused on that strategy. And then Edo, of course, is going to use his stasis strategy maybe for game two. So it's going to be completely different. And all of a sudden, all my creature removal is basically useless. All the cards I boarded in against Bazaar of Baghdad, you know, they're not really going to do anything. So it's it's really interesting to see this this take of Edo on, on Reanimator, making Reanimator stronger because of this stasis time vault plan. Very, very interesting. Thank you for bringing this uh, to the table, Edo. I'm really looking forward to see this deck in action. So this is the deck of Edo. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Ervin's deck, Urnum on Ice. And here we see the deck of Ervin. So this is Urnum on Ice, named after Ice Storm and Urnum Jin. Now basically what this deck wants to do, it wants to win the tempo game, right? So you start, for example, with the Tropical Island. You want to tap that for a Lunawer Elf or a Birds of Paradise so that you have three mana to use in your turn two so that you can cast an Ice Storm. And then you get rid of the land of your opponent and you're already up a mana because of your Lanor Elf or Birds of Paradise or maybe because of a Mox, you know, maybe a Lotus. So the whole idea is that you're ahead of mana and your opponent is kind of down on mana, right? And then in turn three, you try to cast an Urn of Jinn. Maybe you've got even got enough mana for a Sarah Angel. And then you just want to be very aggressive. You just want to keep swinging in and attacking. Now, the interesting thing here, this Urn on Ice deck has some control elements in it as well. We see, uh, for example, the two ice, Icy Manipulators. That's really a good control card. And he can use his Icy Manipulator, of course, to also tap down uh, a creature uh, during the upkeep, or sorry, tap down a land during the upkeep of the opponent. So if you use Ice Storm, to get rid of a land and then you use your Ice Manipulator also to tap a land down of your opponent. That's going to make it really difficult for your opponent to basically do what he wants to do and play his spells and kind of get into the game. So you're disrupting his game plan. So that could kind of work. And then if you at the same time have a creature uh, like an Urnum or a Serra to attack with, that would be like an ideal combination. Um, now in this deck, what's really important is card draw as well because you can go get quite... Uh, you can go quite quickly with this deck because you're like ahead on mana, you control the board, so you can kind of play out all your cards. So you want to make sure that you have some ways to draw cards as well. And that's probably why we see blue in this deck, right? We've got the Brain Geyser, the Time Walk, the Ancestral Recall. So all those cards are basically going to draw new cards for you, So which is pretty good. We also see two Sylvan Libraries. Those cards are pretty important in this deck as well. And Enchantment from Legends, one green and one, and it allows you during your draw step to look at the top three of your cards, choose one of them and just draw them, uh, draw that card. But it also allows you to draw an extra card, up to two extra cards, but you've got to pay four life if you want to do that. Now, um, so you could potentially pay eight life and draw three cards instead of one. Now, eight life may sound pretty steep, but there is a little trick in this deck, which I kind of like. Uh, it's just a small side plan, I guess, in, in Aaron's deck, but I do want to point it out. It's a Preacher Diamond Valley Sylvan Library plan. That's how I'm going to call it. So Preacher is a card from the dark, right? It's a 1-1. One, one. You can tap it and then you steal a creature from your opponent. But your opponent gets to choose which creature it gives to you. So let's say your opponent has, I don't know, a Lanawer Elf and a Nicol Bolas. It's probably going to give you... Maybe it's actually going to give you the Nicol Bolas because you can't pay the upkeep. But just let, let's just say your opponent can, can choose. So it's going to choose the lesser creature. It's going to give it to you, right? That makes sense. The cool thing is here that Erwin has a Diamond Valley, so he can steal the creature, then he can tap the Diamond Valley to eat the creature and actually gain life for a Diamond Valley card from Arabian Nights. Tap and sacrifice a creature and you gain life equal to the toughness of that creature. So you can use your Diamond Valley to kill the creature you just stole with the Preacher and then next turn you can untap your Preacher and you can do the whole thing again. So basically it's a way to remove creatures from your opponent, right? To destroy the creatures from your opponent and you gain life. And that life gain is quite important because with Sylvan Library, you get to draw extra cards, but you have to pay life for it. So if you kind of get that whole synergy combo going, then you can just keep drawing an extra cards and you can, can continue killing the uh, creatures of your opponent. So that would be pretty sweet, actually, Erwin, if, if, if you get around to do that. It, I think it's going to be really tough uh, against the deck of Edo because he also has quite a lot of removal, but it would be really sweet if, you, uh, if that plan is going to come together for you uh, in this matchup. Okay, so this is the deck of Ervin. We also looked at the deck of Edo. So I guess that means we're ready. Let's go to the games. Game number one, here we go. So we've got the Reanimator player Edo sitting on the left and Ervin, the Urnum on Ice player, sitting on the right. 
And uh, that's actually his face on the playmat, by the way, of Erwin. So it's pretty cool. And we see also a really nice Deacon Blackblade uh, playmat from Edo. So really two lovers of the old school game. Let's see End Step Ancestral Recall here by Edo. Going to draw three cards. Let's see what he can do. Draw card number four. Why not get as many cards in hand as you can? And there we see a Mox Jet, a Mox Sapphire, a Mishra's Factory. Okay, so he's doing stuff. Is that a Time Walk? Is he going to cast one? That would be sick. Looks like he's getting back some cards, recounting his hand. Maybe he wants to keep seven in hand, or maybe he wants to discard like a big feather. Remember, he is playing Reanimator, of course. So he's reassessing his hand. He's got that Nicol Bolas in hand. Maybe he wants to toss that into the graveyard. I also see a Demonic Tutor. His hand is just absolute sick. There's a Time Walk. And there's a Demonic Tutor. Wow, what an opening. And do we see a Mind Twist there in his hand as well? Oh, man, if you're Ervin, I mean, this you're toast for this first game. Or at least it looks like it. So he's going to go through his deck. I mean, what do you go for? You've got Ancestral Recall, Time Walk, Demonic Tutor already in the bin. Maybe you should just go for a Recall. Because with a Recall, he can also toss his own um, Nico Bolas in the graveyard, which is something that he wants to do. Because he's playing Reanimator. So, could be interesting. The only thing here is for Edo, he doesn't have a red source to pay for the, um, the upkeep cost here of, uh, of Nico Bolas if he gets to play, uh, play it. So he's going through the motion here. It looks like he's a little bit in the tank. Also having that bizarre Baghdad there as one of the options. I wonder what he's going to go for. Also has that um, Mind Twist in hand still as well. Remember, after this he's going to get the extra turn because he played a Time Walk as well, which makes it even better. Because whatever card you're going to look up, you can play it straight away. Because you get this extra turn. So in your extra turn you can play it. So has he made a decision? Looks like he still hasn't. He's going through the motion again, looking at his hand. He does have an anime dead in there, so a recall will be very tempting. Ooh, Wheel of Fortune would be good. He's got like too many options. Wheel would be really nice, but he doesn't have a red source though, so I don't think I would go for the wheel unless I have a red source in hand. And there's the recall. Okay, but now he's got two cards, though. Like, he cannot take two cards. It's not that good. Demonic Tutor is insane, but not that good, Edo. Looks like... then does he Has he made his decision, then? Is he just going to take the two cards? That's that's not going to happen, right? He wants to... <laughs> I think he realizes it now. Oh, wait a minute. I can only take one. Oh, man. I don't feel sorry for you, Edo. You had an absolute crazy start here. Now he's shuffling again. If I would be Erwin, I would just like get a beer because this is going to take a while. So putting everything back up is going to take his card. And he's going to untap. And okay, let's see. What is he going to do? I do see that recall. So I guess he's chosen the recall. Is he going to cast that or is he going to do the mind twist first? Tapping one black, tapping a blue. Okay, okay, what's he going to do here? Looks like he's going to play the Recall first. Going to play Recall. Going to toss the Nicol Bolas. Makes sense. Going to probably get back Ancestral. Putting Ancestral Recall in hand. He's going to change the mana a little bit so that he can still play out the Ancestral Recall. Going to tap the Tundra. Going to play it. Going to draw three more. Things are really looking good here for Edo. There is the red source he needs. Mox Ruby. There's Bazaar of Baghdad. You could use the Bazaar here, draw two cards, put three more cards in the bin, of course, but it looks like he doesn't have any other creatures in his hand, though. Is he going to use it? It's always a bit of a risk, right? You hope to draw into two big creatures, put that, put that in the graveyard as well, but you just don't know. So he's just going to pass here. He can always use the Bazaar of Baghdad on the end step of Ervin. So Ervin's going to untap. He's going to look at his cards. What can he do here? I 
And he's going to play a Savannah. Going to cast Urnum Jin. Okay, that's actually not too bad. You know, remember, he is playing Urnum on ice. He's got a lot of answers. He's got, you know, four swords, four disenchant. So, I mean, probably there's going to be an anime dead right now, right on a Nico Bolas. But then the chances that Aaron has an answer to that is it's actually pretty likely. I wonder if he's going to play the Mind Twist first, if that's going to be his first choice. No, he's going to play Animate Dead. He wants that Nicol Bolas. And now, I mean, I, I believe he had a Wheel of Fortune in hand as well. Is he going to play the Wheel then? Just going to let go of the Twist. That would be a cool move. Not quite sure what the other cards are, though, in his hand. Tapping a Tundra. Does he have maybe a Swords? Tap the Red Swords. Okay, Disenchant on the Soul Ring. That's a good decision. Because, you know, Urnum on Ice really wants to have mana there to, to play Urnums, to cast the Ice Storms. I do see a land there, I believe, or not. No, is it a land? Yeah, so that's Mishra's Factory. So at least Ervin has his land drop. Tapping one, tapping two. There's Disenchant on the animate. <laughs> and it was like, I don't like that, man. And he's going to quickly sort the Urnum. And unfortunately, the dice here are out of the screen of Ervin. But he's now in 24. So I'll just try to keep track with his life total, keep you updated. And there we see a lot of else. That means he's got four mana to spend next turn. Man, I think I would just play. Uh, yeah, I think I would just play out Wheel of Fortune. Here we see Wheel of Fortune. I like that. I like that 8-0, man. I like it that you didn't didn't go for the uh, for the mind twist plan. So he's drawing seven new cards, and so is Ervin. And then he's using his Bazaar of Baghdad to draw two more. So now he's got to discard three. Discarding two lands and another land. So didn't find any big creatures. Again, he's got Anime Dead playing Underground Sea. You can use Anime Dead again on Nico Bolas. That's exactly what he's going to do. So Nico Bolas is back on the table, ready to swing. What else does he have in hand? It's kind of hard to see there. I did see another Bazaar of Baghdad. And maybe it's better to just keep the bazaar in hand, possibly, you know, use it just to discard for the other bazaar. There is a Preacher. Okay, Preacher is good, but not as great against Nicobolas, because for Nicobolas, you have to pay the upkeep cost of one blue, one red, and one black. And, you know, the only other mana that Erwin can produce is blue mana. Although, of course, he's got Birds of Paradise and City of Brass, but right now it seems very difficult for him to kind of get a red and a black mana. And now I wonder, is he, can he swing in here with Nico Bolas? That would mean that Ervin's going to lose his entire hand. And he wants to chump, but he can't, you know, Ervin, because the Preacher is not a flyer. Oh, so he's going to lose his entire hand. I did see a regrowth there. So he could have opted to possibly regrowth a disenchant and play it on animate. Maybe he didn't realize that Nico Bolas was flying, or maybe he just wanted to, you know, play his Preacher instead. Who knows, really? Um, anyways, taking six damage, and that means he's going to go to 18, I believe, because he wasn't 24 before because of that uh, uh, Swords on the Urnum. It is a really interesting game thus far. Really nice to see, and we see again some discarding from Edo. Gonna go through his graveyard. I don't think there are any creatures in there. And he's gonna go through his hand. What can he do? So Erwin on 16, Ada on 20. He's gonna tap four. There's all Hallows Eve. Interesting choice to play this card now. Because I don't believe there are any more creatures in uh, in his graveyard. So All Hallows Eve, the way it works, it comes into play with two Scream Counters. As soon as the Scream Counters are, are gone from All Hallows Eve, because during your upkeep you take a Scream Counter off, then All Hallows Eve, basically what it does, gets activated, and it reads all creatures in every graveyard come back into play. And we do see a Sarah Angel there on the side of Erwin, I believe. 
So it's an interesting choice to play this All Hallows Eve now. Let's see. So there we see an animate from the Mistress Factory. Is he going to swing in? I mean, exactly. He's got that other factory. So Aaron's changing his mind. He's like, I didn't see it. And his hand is empty, which is never a good feeling, you know, to play with an empty hand. Passing turn here. Looks like he's going to take another six from the Nico Bolas. Of course, Erwin could, if he wants to activate the Preacher, steal the Bolas. But like, like I said before, he cannot pay the upkeep cost. That is the big problem for him. And okay, this is interesting. Edo can now remove the cards from the graveyard of Erwin if he wants to. And there we see that Preacher activation, so he's going to steal it. Which is actually not too bad for Edo, because that means next turn, um, because Erwin cannot pay the upkeep cost, the Nicol Bolas is going to die. And then All Hallows Eve is going to trigger, and he's going to get the Bolas back. So, this is actually... Oh, this is cool. A Time Twister. That is pretty sweet. That is so funny. So, we've seen a wheel, and now we see a Time Twister. This is really a fun game. So both players are going to shuffle back in their graveyards and they're going to draw seven new cards in their hand and then they're going to draw seven new cards. And of course, Edo is really hoping to find some creatures, activate his bazaar, get some more creatures in the bin because next turn that All Hallows Eve is going to, going to go off. But look at that. He's not finding any creatures. Discarding two planes and what else? A bazaar of Baghdad. Oh, that's bad news. At least he's got Ancestral Recall again. That's something. And okay, there we see another Bazaar of Baghdad. And there we see... Interesting. Interesting. We see a Swords on the Preacher. Interesting choices here. There we see a Disenchant on the Anime Dead. And I think Erwin is here not really realizing that the All Hallows Eve is going to trigger. So this is kind of like wasting a disenchant. Or maybe he's got his own reasons to do so. And he's going to look at the top three cards. going to take an extra card. So he's going to drop to 12, I believe. And what can he do here? There we see a strip mine on the Mishra's factory. We see a Black Lotus and a Mox Emerald. So lots of mana here. We see another Preacher in hand here for Erwin. And even, even with the Black Lotus, he still doesn't have all the mana needed to pay for the upkeep cost for the Nico Bolas when it comes back into play because I'm expecting Bolas to make a return. So he's going to animate the factory. He's going to swing in for three. So we see Edo now dropping to 17. There we see a Lanor Elves. What else can he do? There is a Time Walk. And using the Lotus, casting the Preacher. And taking on his extra turn. Wow. This has been a strong turn for, for Erwin, who's really kind of battling his way back into this match. Which is, which is admirable, you know, if, if, if you see the kind of cards that Edo has drawn in this match so far. But of course, Erwin also having a strong deck, finding his power cards, being able to kind of fight back here with that extra turn. Can he swing in again? He's going to swing in for two, for three, for five in total, using Pendlehaven, so six damage. So that's actually quite a lot, six points of damage. Edo's going to drop to 11. We also see that Urnum Jin now hitting the board, so there's pressure from Erwin, that's what he wants to do, end step, bizarre activation. And Edo just can't seem to find his big creatures and now the screen counter is going to go. Oh, Hello's Eve will resolve and we'll see Nicol Bolas coming back again. This, this creature, you just can't get it off the table. If you're Erwin, you're like, man, this is the third time it's risen from the grave. So yeah, let's see what he can do now. Tapping two. Does he have another time walk? No, he's got a Chaos Orb. 
And that means that, you know, if Edo uses the preacher to steal the Nicobolas, and he might want to do that because then he can just swing in with his army, um, you know, Edo can just wait and, and, and use his Chaos Orb, you know, after attackers are declared and then use his Nicobolas again to block, for example, the Urnum. So it's going to be really interesting to see what's going to happen here. If Erwin has a disenchant, that would be absolutely ideal for him. Then he can potentially swing in here for... I mean, if he attacks and there are no blockers at all, he's going to deal 9 damage. Edo's going to drop to 2. And then it's looking really, really bad for Edo. But if Edo can use the Chaos Orb, doesn't miss the flip, he can play it on the Preacher, he gets Nicobolas back. Okay, so here we see. So he's attacking with everything that he has, which I think is good. Oh, with swords, doesn't even need the Chaos Orb. Using the swords, getting the bolas back, blocking and killing the Urnum. He is taking four points of damage. Five points of damage even, I think. Or no, four points, going to drop to seven. And there we also see a Sarah Angel. So a lot of pressure here from Erwin. And I think, I'm not sure what the life total is right now of Erwin. It's got to be around 10, something like that. And he's going to flip on the Sarah Angel probably and then attacking him. Yeah, flipping on the Sarah. Sarah's dead. Going to probably swing in for six. Ooh, that's a brain geyser gone. I think Erwin's now like on four or five, something like that. That brain geyser was actually pretty big. If he could have resolved the brain geyser, Erwin, that could have been his way like to victory, you know. But now he's really low. He's got to protect himself from the Nicol Bolas. I mean, at least he's got the Sylvan to look at the top three cards. Can he find an answer? Swords would be absolutely great. Disenchant would work too. Does he? Oh, he's got a Swords. <laughs> nice. And now uh, Nicol Bolas has finally, is finally gone from the stage because it's removed. There we see a Strip Mine on the factory. Three points of damage, it seems, for Edo. So he's going to drop again to 11, of course, after taking that life from the swords on his own Nicol Bolas. So things are actually looking pretty good for Erwin now. Does have a lot of land on top there, unfortunately for him, but he can swing in for three, so he's gonna drop to eight. So he's, I guess he's on the three turn clock. He's gonna use the bazaar, he's gonna discard some more lands. Only one card in hand though. Oh, it's the Sarah Angel, that is really good news. That's Sarah Angel, because I believe Erwin's on four, so he's gotta find an answer, he's gonna go through his cards. I think they're all lands or not. It's kind of hard. And yeah, that's it. Wow. Ho, ho, ho. What a first game. Absolutely insane. Absolutely crazy. Beautiful magic here from the for Urborg Forest Frenzy in Dusseldorf. Uh, it's organized by uh, Micha and uh, Reindeer, by the way. So shout out to you guys. Also shout out to the Brauhaus. Uh, really, really great location. And to the bartender, Lefty Man. You rock. Oh no, oh man, this is bad. You're probably expecting now to show you game number two, game number three, but I just discovered that there was a glitch in the system and actually the rest of this game has not been recorded. So to go into game number two, everything is as normal. I was recording it and then like midway it stops, which uh, it's just, it's brutal, but I, I still decided to like show you this game number one just because I thought it was such a an awesome game of magic. And uh, I think both decks are great. I think both players, Edo and Erwin, you played absolute fantastic magic. Uh, you brought really cool decks to the table. So I, I hope uh, that you can understand uh, that unfortunately I cannot show you games number two and games number three. What I can tell you is that eventually Edo was able to win this match. The good news is though that I checked the other footage that I have of the tournament and I do have the quarterfinals, the semifinals and the finals. So I will be showing that later. So that all that content is still to come and I can tell you that it, you will see Edo's deck. His deck is coming back. Unfortunately, like Oh man, I'm just really bummed that I cannot show you game number two and game number three because I, I, oh, they were good. But at least we've got game number one. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, so again, I'm really, really sorry I cannot show you the full match here. Unfortunately, the the screen just froze halfway game number two and, and that's it. You know, it didn't record the rest of the match. So just very unfortunate. 
I hope you still enjoyed the content and talking about all of that, um, if you like what you see, if you like Timmy Talks, um, you can help me out actually by supporting the channel. It's quite easy. Uh, just clicking that thumbs up button, that really helps a lot. Also leave a comment. Let me know what you think of both of the decks. Let me know what you think of Edo's Cyborg plan that now we cannot see in action, unfortunately. But what do you think? Um, is it inspiring? Would you also consider playing with a transformational sideboard? I've, I've done it in the past. I wasn't very successful with it, but it's it's kind of fun. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah. There, oh, there's one other thing that you can do if you want to support the channel. You can also support Timmy Talks financially so that, for example, maybe I can get some new recording software that doesn't like glitch in the middle of a recording so I can show you a whole match instead of a third of the match. That would be sweet. Anyway, you can do that by becoming a uh, patron via Patreon. So there's probably a card popping up right now. If you click on that card, then uh, that will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page. And you can already support the channel starting with $1. Um, the cool thing is we've got our own Discord. We've got some online tournaments that he organized for channel members and patrons. And also your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. Talking about the end scroll, let's take a look at our fantastic and wunderbar channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Let's go to the end scroll. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazee.